Okay. All right. Sorry about a little bit of technical difficulties there, but we should be good to start pretty soon. We'll just wait a few more minutes to make sure that we can get some more people logged on. And while we're waiting, we can go over some of these reminders that we have on the screen. Um, so just for your information, the chat is disabled to minimize some of that distraction, but you can post your questions and answers in the QA section, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you want to choose the gallery view, that way you'll be able to see all panelists at once instead of um, just the speaker view, which you'll only be seeing the speaker uh, who is talking at that present moment. Um, just so you know, all attendees are muted and the video is off, so you don't need to worry about that. We can't see or hear you. Um, and so a lot of our lessons are going to be interactive, so it might be beneficial to have a pen and paper to write down ideas you get if you want to um, maybe share some of these ideas with family and friends later on. And then a recording of the webinar will be available. We will use your registration email to go ahead and send that out to you once we're done with our webinar today. So if you feel like you missed something or you maybe wanted to watch a video again, uh, you will be able to do so because we'll share that recording with you all. Um, and then I just want to give out a thanks to our sponsor, Budget Dumpster. Each year they help support conservation organizations across the country by donating dumpsters for cleanup events. This is a really important service and we're really thankful for their support. So thank you, Budget Dumpster. And thank you also to our awesome presenters we have today. I'm really excited that you're gonna be able to hear um, some great lessons and hear from really cool people in our community. And for future engagement, check out some of the stuff that we're doing um, online right now. You can follow us at river.link on Instagram and make sure to check out some of our other presenters online resources as well. Um, we've been converting to online resources for education um, and there's a lot of really cool stuff happening so you can stay engaged and do lots of cool stuff even while in quarantine. But my name is Hallie. I'm going to be the host for the webinar today and we're going to be celebrating Earth Day together. So we're really excited to have you here. We hope you can learn a lot. And um, this recording will be available afterwards so you can share it with your friends and family and you can continue celebrating Earth Day into the future. Um, I'm just gonna start with running through today's agenda to give you an idea of what we're gonna be doing today. If you didn't hear me introduce myself the first time, my name is Hallie. I'm the Public Engagement Coordinator with Riverlink, serving through AmeriCorps Project Conserve. And we have a special guest today, which is my roommate's cat. And we've got Harry Otter, Riverlink's mascot, here to celebrate Earth Day with us today. So really excited about that. Um, so we're going to start with a presentation about Earth Day history. And then we're going to hear from the Nature Center. And they're going to give us a, an interactive game of fact or myth. Um, after that, we'll have a lesson from Greenworks on tree identification, uh, followed by an art and poetry contest announcement. Another lesson from Mountain True on um, stream quality mo monitoring and um, another art and poetry contest announcement. From SAHC, we'll have a lesson on the Appalachian Mountains and a craft, which will be really fun. From Conserving Carolina, we'll have a Leave No Trace lesson. From EQI, we'll have a watershed craft. And then Riverlink is a stormwater model lesson. One more art and poetry contest announcement. And then we'll end things off around one o'clock. All right, so we can get started then. So today we are celebrating Earth Day together, but separately. Um, because of COVID, we've had to make a lot of changes, uh, but we're still really excited to be able to celebrate Earth Day with you all today. Um, and just to keep in mind, we're gonna be learning lots of really exciting stuff today. And it's probably going to make you feel pretty inspired to go outside and to celebrate Earth Day outside. Um, but just make sure that you're following those stay home order rules. So you're social distancing, you're not going to any trails that are closed. And if an area is particularly crowded, make sure you're going somewhere else, finding another spot and making sure to follow that social distancing rule. So we're excited to give you some inspiration and hope that you can 
uh, do some really fun stuff outside. We live in a really beautiful spot, so um, there are lots of opportunities to go outside and do cool, cool things. All right, so um, Riverlink every year for the past six years has hosted an Earth Day Kids Festival. Um, Riverlink mission is to connect communities to their watershed. Here in Asheville, we live in the French Broad River watershed. We spend lots of time teaching stream table lessons, doing trash cleanups, and having fun community workshops. While we are sad we can't see you in person today, we're just, we're really excited to have you and we're glad that we can continue this tradition another year, even if it is virtual. Um, and the COVID pandemic is a reminder of the impact that we have on the planet as humans. Um, in the future, we don't want to watch nature on a screen or through a video, we want to be able to go outside and enjoy it in person. Um, so that's why it's so important that we care for our earth and we continue to do things uh, to protect it. All right. So now we'll get into a little bit of the history of Earth Day. Today is April 22nd and it is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, which is really exciting. A lot has happened since then. Um, so we can start by talking about the beginning and what life was kind of like before we had the first Earth Day. Um, so before first, the first Earth Day, there were a lot of environmental issues in the United States because of a lack of environmental laws, rules, regulations. Um, so lots of companies were using dangerous chemicals such as DDT. Um, there was pollution getting into our air and water. And there was a really big oil spill in Santa Barbara in 1969 that killed a lot of animals and really disrupted that ecosystem. So lots of bad stuff was happening to the environment and people were getting really upset. Um, and so some really important figures stepped forward to kind of get people together to call for change. Um, one of those people was U.S. Senator Nelson, along with tons of other environmental activists who wrote books, and um, made a call for change in our environmental policy. Um, and that's how, in 1970, the first Earth Day celebration came to be. And at that first celebration, over 20 million people participated. So that's really awesome, really exciting. Um, and ever since then, lots of positive changes have been made. So as a result, we got the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, and the Environmental Protection Agency was formed. So all things that um, were made or put into place to protect the environment and to have more official laws and rules that could um, further protect the environment so that we could celebrate it every day like we're doing now. And because of that, Earth Day became not only a celebration in the United States, but it became something that was celebrated internationally, and it has become a global celebration, which is really exciting to see that so many people are excited about the earth that we live on, and they want to do everything they can do to protect it. So what has changed since the first Earth Day? Since 1970, there's been lots of rallies and marches of people showing their support. Um, lots of environmental laws have been passed, which is awesome. And while we've achieved a lot, there's still so much to do. Um, today, some of the big things we're facing are habitat loss, pollution, and one of the big ones is climate change, along with lots of other things that I'm sure you're learning about in some of, some of your classes. Um, so a question for you would be, if we treated every day as Earth Day, would the environment be different? Carry forward, not only do we celebrate it on April 22nd, but we can celebrate it tomorrow and the next day. And we can do lots of fun activities to protect our earth and to care for the natural environment that we live in. All right, and what can we do? So a lot of that stuff can be kind of heavy and kind of hard to talk about. It's a little bit scary at times, uh, but there, there's just so much that we can do. Um, and we can do it together. So it's not something that we have to tackle alone, which is really great. Um, the number one thing that we can do is simply care. Um, we can get to know our local environment and then find ways to appreciate and protect it. 
Um, something that we do at Riverlink is we focus our lessons on the French Broad River, which is our, um, which is the watershed that we're living in, the French Broad River watershed. So we do lots of activities focused on how we can protect that water source. That's part of our local environment that we can care about and protect. Um, and then there's the um, really important reduce, reuse, recycle, um, with an emphasis on reduce and reuse, making sure we're limiting those things that we're using and reusing them before recycling. Um, some other fun stuff is we can plant, plant native plants and trees, start a garden. It's really fun to use um, recycled materials to start a garden. So if you have an egg carton, it's actually perfect as a greenhouse for seedlings. So all sorts of ways that you can reuse materials. Um, and then most importantly, use your voice to make change. And that's gonna inspire your friends and family who can further make positive change in our environment. All right, and before we start with our next lesson, just wanna say thank you to our awesome presenters who have put in a lot of work and time into their presentations. So today we have Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy. We've got Mountain True, Conserving Carolina, EQI, Asheville Greenworks, and Friends of the WNC Nature Center. So thank you all so much for being here. We're really grateful for your time and for your effort in putting together some awesome lessons. So we are going to have a lesson from Tori at WNC, Friends of the WNC Nature Center. She's gonna give an interactive lesson called Fact or Myth. Um, now is a good time to grab that pen and paper if you wanna write some things down. Um, and this is a lesson that you can find um, at some of the Nature Center's online resources if you want to rewatch it. Hi everybody. In the meantime, Oh, sorry about that. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Tori, and I'm the Outreach Educator for the Friends of the WNC Nature Center, which means that I am usually the traveling animal lady. So I'm often cruising around in the wild wagon, bringing all sorts of animal education programs, to schools and libraries and retirement communities and all sorts of other facilities throughout Western North Carolina. And I also do tabling events like for the Earth Day Kids Festival put on through Riverlink. And today I'm going to be celebrating Earth Day right here in my own home with you guys. All right, so today to celebrate Earth Day, we're going to play a game called Fact or Myth. And if you guys have been following the Nature Center on Facebook or Instagram, you might know this game already because we've played one round of this game during my Wild at Home series, which airs every Monday. So don't worry if you've played this game before, I'm not gonna do the same fact or myths. We're gonna learn some new stuff today. And if you haven't played this game before, it's very easy to play along at home. So a fact is something that is true, and a myth is something that is not true. It's something that's false, but it's something that a lot of people think is true, like a legend or a tall tale or an old wives' tale. So we're going to be learning some facts and busting some myths. All you have to do at home is if you happen to have red and green paper, you're most welcome to make signs and you can vote that way. Or of course, you can just use your thumbs and vote thumbs up for fact and thumbs down for myth. All right, so I'm gonna say something about an animal and I'm gonna give you guys a second to decide at home whether you think what I'm saying is a fact or a myth. So let's go ahead and get started. And I think that the first animal that we are going to start with is a black bear. And I do actually have some bio facts to show you guys as well. So my first bio fact is a black bear skull. So you can see some pretty impressive teeth in there. All right, so our black bear fact or myth, black bears can be many different colors besides black. Black bears can be many different colors besides black. So I'm gonna put my skull down here. I'm gonna give you guys just a second to vote. Do you think what I'm saying is a fact or a myth? All right, everyone ready? That first animal statement is, drum roll, 
It's a fact. So even though scientists named them black bears, black bears actually come in a large variety of colors. Yes, they definitely can be black. They can also be brown. They can be cinnamon. They can be blonde. They can be tan. They can be white. They can be so dark black, they almost look sort of blue, like that really dark midnight blue color. So black bears have a huge amount of color variation, and a lot of it has to do with their habitat and how they're going to blend in with their surroundings. Here in the Southern Appalachian Mountains, usually we see black black bears, but in other parts of the world, you might see some different colors. All right, so let's see. Our next animal statement is going to be about turtles. It's going to be about turtles. And I have for you guys to check out here today. This is a box turtle shell. I'm not going to show you the back just yet. And box turtles are the state reptile of North Carolina. And we do have quite a few box turtles living at the nature. If you guys have ever seen them before, if you've ever checked out some of our turtles or maybe even met some of them. So here is my animal statement about turtles. And it's not just about box turtles. All turtles can pull into their shells. What do you think? Is that a fact or a myth? All turtles can pull into their shells. All right, our next animal statement is a myth. So not all turtles can pull into their shells. Many of them can. But one of the most famous turtles that cannot pull into its shell is the sea turtle. And I bet a lot of you guys at home were thinking of the sea turtle if you said myth. But there is a turtle around here that doesn't pull into its shell either. Can anyone think of what that turtle is? And we do have one of, we have several of these actually living at the nature center. It's the snapping turtle. So as snapping turtles grow older, when they're very, very young, they can pull into their shells some. But as they grow older and become adults, there's just not enough space for them to pull into their shells. And they have other ways of protecting themselves. They have very, very long arms and legs and tails. They can swim very well. And of course, they can snap too. All right, good job, guys. We're gonna do a few more of these. Our next animal statement, let's do something furry, something with fur. We're going to do otters. So I have for you guys, one of my favorite things to teach with is our otter fur. Now, as I'm showing you guys all of these bio facts, not just the fur, but everything else that we've looked at so far, sometimes we get the question, where did you get that item? Did you hurt any animals to get that object? And that's a very important question to ask, and I hope you guys are asking that question when you see things like this. And I do want to reassure you that we have not hurt or harmed any animals to get these bio facts. All of these animals passed away from natural causes, and then we are giving them the opportunity to sort of live on and be education ambassadors and help people learn about why these animals are so important. So I just want to put your minds at ease. So our next bio fact is an otter fur. This is from a North American river otter. And you can see this was a rather long otter. All right, so our next animal statement about otters. Otters are in the same family as beavers. Otters are in the same family as beavers. What do you guys think? Is that a fact or a myth? All right, our next animal statement about otters being in the same family as beavers is a myth. And this one was a little tricky because if you've seen otters and you've seen beavers, they look pretty similar, right? They both have that brown fur that always looks wet because they've got those nice oils that slick the water off of their fur. They usually live in pretty similar areas. You know, they both spend a lot of time in the water, near the water, but they're actually in two different families. So beavers are in the rodent family. And if you've ever seen a beaver's two front teeth, they've got those two big front teeth that have the brown enamel on the front. That's a classic rodent feature. So rodents are like rats and mice, and that's the family that beavers are in. Now otters are in the weasel family. So I like to think of otters as giant swimming weasels, um, which means that they are definitely carnivores. They're definitely predators. They are hunters and they have very sharp teeth. So even though otters and beavers may look similar on the outside, their teeth are very different and they have very different diets. They're not in the same family. All right, maybe I tricked a few of you guys with this one. I think we've got time for maybe one more fact or myth and let's make this one about 
snakes. All right. I do not have a live snake. I wish that I did, but like I said, I'm at my house and I have cats as pets. I do not have snakes, but I do have some snake shed for you guys to check out here. So this is from one of our corn snakes. All right. So my final animal statement about snakes. Snakes are slimy. Snakes are slimy. What do you guys think? All right, our last animal statement, we can do a drum roll one more time, is a myth. And this is something that I hear a lot from people who have never touched a snake before. So snakes are not slimy animals. Sometimes they can look slimy just because they're very, very shiny. Some, some snakes are very, very shiny. But they are not slimy, they're dry animals. There is a slimy animal that you might be thinking of. It's not a snake, it's a salamander. So snakes are reptiles and salamanders are amphibians. And amphibians have smooth, usually wet skin with the exception of toads. And reptiles have scales on their skin like we saw in our snake shed and they are dry. The only time a snake is gonna be wet is if it's getting into the water and soaking itself which actually does help them shed their skin. All right, I wanna thank you guys so much for joining us. I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments and I would be happy to answer questions that you have. But in the meantime, happy Earth Day and hopefully I'll get to see you guys at the Nature Center soon. Bye. All right. Well, that was awesome. So thanks to Tori at the Nature Center for putting that together for us. Um, Tori did a really great job busting some of those myths that we have about different animals. Um, and now we are going to hear from Peter Menzies at Asheville Greenworks about tree identification. Um, but before we start that, if you wanted to check out some of those Nature Center videos, they have lots of really great online resources and you can play more games like Factor Myth. Um, if you'd like to do that with some of your friends and your family in the future. All right, now we'll start this video from Peter at Asheville Greenworks. Hey there, folks. My name is Peter Menzies. I'm an environmental educator with Asheville Greenworks. This is my co-host, whose name is also Peter. And welcome to an episode of Tree Time with the Peters. Today, we're going to be talking about tree identification. Wait, what are we talking about? Tree identification. What is it? Don't do that. So what is tree identification? Tree identification is looking at a tree and observing various characteristics about it and trying to determine what species it is. Let's name some of these characteristics. Bark, leaves, fruits. Don't forget the flowers. We're also gonna be talking about something called branching pattern, a branching structure. Do uh, you mind if I eat a snack while we're recording? It's fine with me. Awesome, dude. Is that a block of cheese? No, I'm not a weirdo. Let's spend a little time talking about those components that I just named. Bark. This is on the ground. I did not rip it off the tree. When we're observing bark, we're looking for color, texture, and any patterns. Why do trees have bark? To protect the tree. Exactly. It's kind of like our skin. When we observe leaves, we're looking at the overall shape of the leaf. Maybe it looks like this. Maybe it has these parts that stick out called lobes. We're also looking at the edge of the leaf. And we want to feel the leaf. Is it fuzzy? Is it smooth? Leaves can tell us a lot. What do leaves do? They look cool. They do look cool. They also perform photosynthesis. <laughs> Many trees produce fruits. So fruits are not just the yummy foods that you find in a fruit salad. Fruits are anything that a flowering plant produces that contains its seed or seeds. Spoiler alert, this is a walnut, and it's the fruit of a certain type of walnut tree. I can't believe we'd spoil that for them. Many trees produce flowers for reproductive purposes. We can use them to help identify the species. Real quick, let's talk about branching pattern. Branching pattern is the way in which new growth is positioned on a plant. The three patterns we're going to talk about today are alternate, opposite, and world. On an alternately branched plant, new growth is positioned on the main stem in an alternating fashion. An oppositely branched plant has new growth positioned opposite one another. In the case of a world branching pattern, three or more new stems are positioned at the same point on the main stem. All right, I know that was a lot of information, but I think we're finally ready to start identifying some trees. Finally! <laughs> I think it only makes sense to kick things off with this beautiful tree I've been standing in front of. Let's figure out what it is. When we take a closer look at the bark. Wow. What do we notice? First, let's look at the color. 
dark grayish, kind of brown, some splotches of light gray. Let's look for any patterns. So we have these sort of indentations here. Those are known as furrows. That's something to note. And then these raised portions, known as ridges. And these ridges are kind of flattened and it's kind of scaly. When we turn our attention to the top of the tree or the crown, we find a lot more clues. The first thing that I notice is that the leaves on this tree are in fact needles. Are you serious? So that narrows down our possibilities quite a bit. We're also able to spot the branching pattern from here. Can you tell what it is? Pete, can you give us a refresher on those branching patterns? Oh, I got this. Alternate, opposite, world. Is any of that related to branching patterns? Nope. Let's look back at our mystery tree. Because there are many smaller branches positioned at the same point in the main stem, this tree is... World! Yes! Alright, some of you may already have a good inkling of what this tree is, but we're going to look at a few more clues just to make sure. So an important thing about being a naturalist, or someone who identifies natural things, is not just looking at the tree itself, but looking around for other clues. So trees drop things. They drop fruit. They drop leaves. They drop twigs. So let's look on the ground and see what we can find. After a quick look around, we found a pine cone and a branch with needles on it that I'm pretty sure came from that tree. I found a spoon. So the fact that we found a pine cone makes me think that we're looking at a pine tree. You see, pine branches have little bundles of needles, and these bundles are called fascicles. So you can find a particular bundle, and let's see how many needles it has. So it says one, two, three, four, five. Hmm. I think we have all the clues we need. If you're watching this and know the answer, go ahead and shout it out. What do you got for us, Pete? It's definitely a tree. And the actual answer is Eastern White Pine. <laughs> Eastern White Pine, Latin name, Pinus strobus. It's a member of the pine family. And fun fact, in uh, colonial times, it was the predominant tree used to build ship masts because of its strength and flexibility. Right here, we got our next mystery tree. Oh my God. First thing that I notice is a particular shape throughout the bark. What shapes do you see? Now, you may have to use your imagination a little bit, but I see diamonds in this park. When we look up, we can see that it's starting to leaf out, but it hasn't finished doing so yet. So it could be difficult to identify based on the leaves. But what we can tell is that it's alternately branched. So the clues we have so far are diamond shapes in the bark and alternate branching structure. I think we're gonna need some more clues. Let's take a look on the ground. I found a bunch of these on the ground. Same. So these are walnuts. I think we have enough information to make our guess now. What do you think, Pete? I'm gonna go with black walnut. That's exactly what I was thinking, Pete. So this mystery tree here is a black walnut. The Latin name is Juglans nigra. Get it? Juglans. It's a member of the walnut family or the Juglandaceae. Its wood is highly prized for its beautiful dark brown color and the walnuts are edible. So we found another tree to identify. It's a little one, but it is in fact a young tree. Let's figure out what it is. First thing that I notice is that this tree has spines. That's a big hint. This tree actually has leaves at eye level, so that's gonna help us out a lot. Let's take a look at them. The interesting thing is that this whole structure is actually a single leaf, and these smaller components are called leaflets. What kind of leaf is this? Compound leaf. Yep. The fact that this tree has compound leaves helps us narrow down our choices a lot. We can also look at the shape of the leaflets. So these are rounded and somewhat oblong, and we can also count the number of leaflets. This has 13. There's no flowers on the tree, and I couldn't find any of last year's fruits on the ground. I found a fruit. So we know this tree has spines, and it has compound leaves with many rounded leaflets. And alternate branching pattern. I think I know what it is. What about you, Pete? I'm gonna go with black locust. That's what I'm thinking too. So guys, this is a black locust. The Latin name is Robinia pseudoacacia. It's a member of the pea family or the Fabaceae family. It's a nitrogen fixer, and it also produces really strong rot-resistant wood. So for ages, they've been used to build fence posts. So our next tree is red. What? Is that the bad monster? No way, man. Pack monster's not real. It's, it's just an urban legend. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're right. I'm being crazy. I'm just... <laughs> Whew. Okay, so our next tree is right over here. You can see it uh, with these beautiful magenta flowers. 
It's also a young tree like the black locust that we were looking at. Um, let's take a closer look. This tree is already leafed out, and as you can see, it has distinctly heart-shaped leaves. That's beautiful. So the twig has a zigzag shape to it, and it's also alternately branched. Let's not forget these beautiful pink flowers that we saw earlier. So the clues that we have are heart-shaped leaves, a zigzag twig that's alternately branched, and pinkish magenta flowers. I think I know what it is. What do you think, Pete? It's a red bud. What are you doing over there? Social distancing. Dude, we are literally the same person. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's right. It's an eastern red bud. The Latin name is Circus canadensis, like our black locust. It's also a member of the pea family. It's a really common tree around here, and its flowers are an important nectar and pollen source for early spring pollinators. That's all we got for today, folks. If you want to learn more about identifying trees in our area, check out the Asheville Greenworks Tree Discovery Guide available on our website. Thanks for tuning in. You think this came from a spoon tree? All right. Well, thank you to Peter for putting that on. That was awesome. So next we're going to have Anna giving an art and poetry announcement. Um, Anna, if you would like to come on and get that started, that would be awesome. Hi everyone. So my name is Anna Miller, just like Hallie said. Thanks, Hallie. And I am the education coordinator at Riverlink through AmeriCorps. In my position, I get to take a big part in planning for our art and poetry contest that Riverlink does. This year is the 13th annual contest, so it's been going on for quite a long time. Each year with the contest, we ask that pre-K through 12 students in the French Broad River watershed submit artwork and poems, and for the second year, videos that relates to a theme that we give them for the year. Our theme for this year was for them to show us what the river means to them. There was a lot of uh, submissions from really talented students. We got lots of artwork. We had some 2D sculpture or 3D sculptures, uh, some poems, and a video from one of the schools as a full class too. So it was really great. Um, I'm going to share with you some slides now and we're going to get started on announcing and I also have pictures of our judges. I want to thank our judges too. Uh, they're all local artists and filmmakers and photographers. Um, and we're really thankful for them helping us to narrow down all of our submissions to the winners that you'll be hearing today during our contest. So let me get my slides up. All right. So these are all of our judges, uh, Steve Barr, Megan Shepard, Israel Golden, Kendra Ray, Garrett Martin, and Bridget Benton, all local artists, and some of them are authors, uh, some of them are videographers, lots of really great work that they do, and they really enjoyed all of the talented students and their, ta their um, pieces that they shared with us for the contest this year. So how we're going to announce the winners is we're going to do it in three parts during the event today. I'll start off with announcing the pre-K through second grade winners, and then after a couple more lessons, we'll announce the third through fifth grade, and then at the end of our event, we'll announce the sixth through eighth grade, and then our ninth through twelfth grade winners as well. So stay tuned throughout the event to hear all of the winners. And I'll get started with our pre-K through second grade winners. All right, so third place in the 2D and 3D art category for pre-K through second grade is Raleigh Edwards with his piece Lake Julian, which you can see a picture of there. So his was a 3D piece that had some materials from nature, some pine cones, some rocks and seashells in there. So kind of really great mixed media artwork that he put in. And again, while I'm announcing these, or for the first time while I'm announcing these, if I don't say your name right, I'm terribly sorry about that. Um, but I do have it spelled out there, so hopefully you can see it. Okay, so Raleigh Edwards was third place for 2D and 3D artwork in our pre-K through second grade, grade range. And then we have Ruel Tachenko with their piece Sunset on the French Broad. They got second place for our 2D and 3D art category for pre-K through second grade. And they wrote this uh, as kind of an explanation for their piece, so I'll read that out to you now. My painting is called Sunset on the French Broad because I love sunsets and I love the river. People should learn about the French Broad River because it is a part of nature. We need clean water so that the plants can grow and we need plants to eat. It is important to keep nature clean because all of nature is pretty. And then for our first place winner of the 2D and 3D art category for pre-K through second, we have Aoife Mayer and her piece was titled Paddling with Dad. 
and she also has something to go along with that. So that's her piece that she painted there, showing her and her dad paddling going down a waterfall, which is great. And then she kind of wrote this poem to go along with it. The river is blue and green. The river is a time to have fun. I like the river because it is pretty. I like the river because I love to go with my family. The river is quiet. I like the river because it's a nice, quiet place. The river is calm. The river is fun to play in. There's lots of reasons that she loves the river, telling us what it means to her. Uh, that is really important for her and her family. And that is all of our winners for our pre-K to second grade. We didn't have any poetry for that grade range uh, submitted to us, but that's okay. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And those were our three winners for our pre-K through second grade grade category. Really proud of them, really excited to share that with you. And you'll be able to hear the third through fifth grade after a couple more lessons and then sixth through eighth grade and ninth through twelfth at the end. So again, stay tuned for those. And I'll turn it back to you, Hallie. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Anna. That was awesome. Congratulations to all of those. Uh, keep on making art. It's really beautiful and it's really inspiring to see. So thanks so much and congratulations on winning. Um, next up, we'll have Grace from Mountain True, and she's going to give us a lesson about stream quality monitoring. So Grace, if you're ready, if you'd like to come on and share your lesson with us. Hi, all. Uh, my name is Grace Fuchs, and I am the Water Quality Administrator with Mountain True. A lot of what I do for part of my work is go out and sample our streams, and today's activity is going to take you through how you can look at some of the critters in a stream in your backyard or in your community. Um, hopefully after this I'll be able to share the identification sheet and the worksheet you need to do this, but um, my video is just a little step by step of how to go through that process. I hope you enjoy. Well, today's activity is called Biomonitoring Brilliance. Biomonitoring is when scientists use living organisms and their tolerance value to assess the health of an ecosystem. Today we're going to look at aquatic macroinvertebrates. These freshwater bugs are often larvae of flies and other things that eventually will emerge from the water and live the rest of their life out on land. We're going to look at macroinvertebrates which are animals that don't have a backbone and are big enough to see with your naked eye. Biomonitoring is important because animals live for a long time in the ecosystem, so it can give us an idea of the overall health of the ecosystem. The health of streams can be impacted by several things, including agricultural waste, sewage, trash, industrial and chemical spills, and fossil fuel byproducts. Biomonitoring helps us determine a biotic index score. This correlates to a health rating of the stream, and in this case, the lower the biotic index score, the healthier the stream is. We're going to calculate the biotic index of an example site and go through some macroinvertebrate identification and learn how to calculate the biotic index score by looking at the number of bugs that we find and taking the tolerance value of each different kind of bug that we find into our calculation. So we're going to start off here with our most sensitive macroinvertebrates. Um, they've, all of these groups have an assigned tolerance value. The Plecoptera, or the stonefly, has the lowest tolerance value to pollution. So this means these bugs need really, really clean water and are very sensitive to pollution. These guys are easy to identify because they have two tails on the end of their bodies. On the right, we have our Ephemeroptera, or our mayflies, that are also pretty sensitive. And these guys have three tails. Next, we have our Trichoptera, or our caddisfly. These guys look kind of worm-like, but they still have legs up next to their head. Sometimes if they're outside of their house, they curl up into a C shape, but a lot of caddisflies actually build their own houses for them to retreat into when they feel threatened. Next, we have our Coleoptera, or our beetles, with a tolerance value of three. On the right, 
we have an adult larval riffle beetle, and below that we have a water penny. These water pennies resemble a penny due to their color and shape and are often found stuck to the bottom of rocks. Next we have our dragonflies and our damselflies, or our odonates. Like I said, a lot of the aquatic macroinvertebrates in our streams are their larval stages of flies, and so you'll often see dragonflies flying around a body of water, and that's because they actually started their life in water. On the left there is a damselfly, which is longer and skinnier, and has three tails at the end of its body. And then we have our dragonfly, which is a little bit stouter and thicker. For Megaloptera, our helgramites, these guys tend to be big predators. Um, they can grow three or four inches long. They have big pinchers and a lot of different legs. And they'll tend to prey on some of the smaller macroinvertebrates. Our last groups of macroinvertebrates both have a tolerance value of 5 and can withstand heavy levels of pollution. First we have our diptera, or our true flies. These guys look a lot like worms, they don't have any legs, and they just have mouth parts at one end of their body in order to eat. And lastly we have our gastropoda, or our snails. They tend to look a lot like snails on land and are pretty easy to identify. So I'm going to take you through how to calculate the biotic index by going through a sample of bugs that we're going to call Site 1. Um, these bugs were all collected at the site, and so I'm going to go through and identify them first. So we have 10 bugs in our sample, and we have two stoneflies, which are in the blue oval on the far left, and we can tell that because they both have two tails. Next to them in the orange are our odonates, with a damselfly on top and a dragonfly on bottom. In our green circle, we have one caddisfly, not in a house. In the upper right hand corner, we have an adult riffle beetle and our water penny, our coleoptera group. Below them, we have our mayflies with three tails. And lastly, we have one snail. So now that we've collected our data, we're going to use our calculation worksheet to find our biotic index score for site one. On the first column, we have our different groups of macroinvertebrates. In the second column, there's the tolerance value, which is given for each group. In the third column, we have our number of specimens, which is the number of bugs in each group that we found. And we had a total of 10 bugs in our sample at site one, but in order to get a more accurate biotic index score, you would want to use a larger sample size, but for the sake of time, we're just looking at 10 today. The next step is to calculate the product. So we're going to take the tolerance value for each group and multiply it by the number of specimens we had. So for the first row for our mayflies, they have a tolerance value of one, and we had two of them in our sample, so our product's going to be two. So we're going to do that for all our groups, and our total product, when we add everything up, is 21. And in order to find our biotic index score, we're going to divide the total product by the total number of specimens. So in this case, we're going to have 21 divided by 10, and that's going to give us 2.1. Now looking at our biotic index score chart, we can see that a biotic index of 2.1 means that our stream health rating is excellent because it falls into the category of less than 3.09. So that means the water quality at the site is really, really good. There's a lot of things that factor into stream health, but the overarching component is land use surrounding a stream. Forested areas, especially in protected lands, tend to have more pristine streams and rivers because there's more, a larger buffer between human contact and the stream. 
forests can help filter out pollution as the water flows down to the river and provide lots of organic nutrients for the animals that live in the river. Obviously, trash and litter can also degrade the habitat of streams, so it's really important to make sure that that's disposed of properly. And also that there's native plant species around because many of the organisms in our freshwater streams are dependent on native plants for food or some other part of their life cycle. So we have finished our Biomonitoring Brilliance program and I just wanted to post my contact info if anyone has questions or comments about this presentation or wants to reach out and learn more about what Mountain True does. Thanks so much for listening. All right, thanks Grace, that was awesome. Um, we do have one question that came up in the Q&A, and that is, does every water creature have a tolerance rating? Um, do you want to give that a shot? Yeah, um, so the tolerance value is determined by species level, so not even all the same not even all the mayflies have the same tolerance value. It depends on what subspecies they are. Um, so this is kind of just a generalized version of mayflies in general are very intolerant to pollution and worms are not, even though um, that differs on a species by species basis. And Mountain True's um, biomonitoring program are stream information, stream monitoring information exchange uses um, more detailed species identification and so we use the individual uh, tolerance values in that case. Um, and we do have one more question. Uh, this will be the last question for this lesson just so we make sure that we're staying on schedule but we have a question from John Lloyd David um, and he asks, do some invertebrates need pollution? I wouldn't say um, any of the invertebrates need pollution. Um, there are certainly ones that can thrive in a polluted environment as well as a clean one, um, but that's not the case for most of our aquatic species. Um, in really polluted waters, you'll just find like snails and leeches and not really a lot of biodiversity. Um, and there's certain animals that, you know, use nutrients that are found in pollution, so that's why they thrive there where um, others do not. Awesome, thank you. Um, we do have one more question in the chat, but if you want to answer that uh, via the chat, that would be perfect. All right, so next up we're going to have Layla with Riverlink, and she's going to be giving an art and poetry contest announcement. Um, so we're really excited about that, and let's see what we've got. So thanks, Hallie. Um, we're super excited to announce our winners for this section. Let me share my screen. All right, so I'm handling the third to fifth grade winners. And just as a quick thing, I'm Layla Johnston. I'm the development director with Riverlink. It's great to be on here and sharing in Earth Day today. 50th anniversary is a pretty big deal. So third through fifth grade winners. In third place in the 2D and 3D art category is Layla Palumbi, so same name as me. And her piece is entitled The French Broad Fish. Next is Sarah Wallace, and her piece is The River Should Stay Clean All Year Round, and she got second place in our 2D and 3D art category. And in first place for our 2D and 3D art category is Cecilia Gomez, and her piece is entitled Asheville. And in our poetry and writing category, um, Zaneda Leitner is The River is Special Haikus, and we're gonna be unmuting her so she can actually read her haiku and share it with us today. So um, my haikus are titled, The River is Special. So here you go. Um, first one is called Stream Life. River life playing, dancing through the creeks and streams, swirling around the rocks. The second one is called Save the Stream. Please help save the stream, pick up trash, clean the waters. The stream is our friend. The third one is called the gurgling stream. The gurgling stream stirring past rocks and bends, waking up the world. 
and the fourth is called Block Dove. Trash clogs the stream, water sludging past, water struggling past the sludge. I will break it free. Thank you, Zaneda, for sharing today, hopping on and sharing with us and actually reading your work. We really appreciate it and congratulations. Our second place in poetry and writing category is Marta Rosal, The Story of the River. We also shared all of our winners in a slideshow that you can view after this. You can check all of our submissions out and check out what the art and the writing looked like. And in first place for poetry and writing category is Ava Kilpatrick with The French Broad River. Go ahead and read it really quick. The French Broad River. Your rushing water shines in the light. The amazing scenery is a wonderful sight. As your speckled trout swim upstream, down the sun shines and makes you gleam. You give me comfort as much as I need. Your wonderful water calms me. The beautiful mountains that surround you are a beautiful sight to see. When you look at them, you feel a life of ease. The majestic waterfalls that you possess are the most amazing things nonetheless. As the blue heron flies above, there is absolutely nothing else I can do but love. At the end of the day, when the sun sets, looking back from the start, I have absolutely no regrets. There is always a time where I must go, when the moon starts to rise and gives off a magnificent glow. And even when I am gone and the day is done, may your rapid currents continue to run. Thank you, Ava. That is super beautiful. And then first place video category, the Rainbow Community School fifth grade class. And a quick little blurb on it before we check out the video. The choice for the rivers and roads was based on our river study, early American studies traveling to new lands from faraway countries and the plight of refugees in the present day at our borders. This group of students is so talented musically that this was the perfect piece to highlight their abilities on instruments and harmonies. I am so proud of this performance and this class. That was a comment from the fifth grade teacher, Emily Rogalski. So let's check out this video. And I think several of you are on. So we are really excited to have you here and to celebrate your first place video submission.
Thank y'all so much for sharing that with us. You are all so talented and we are so proud of you. And we're super excited about announcing all of our winners today. And Hallie, back to you. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Ella. And thank you, Zaneda, for reading your poem. That was amazing. Uh, thank you to all of uh, the artists who submitted their works of art to Riverlink for the contest. It's really inspirational and super beautiful. Um, we hope that it serves as an inspiration for you all um, in quarantine right now, making art, writing poems, taking pictures, all that stuff is there are things that you can do um, while in quarantine. So we hope that uh, you continue doing awesome stuff like that. And next we have Hannah from SAHC, it's SAHC, excuse me, <laughs> and she's going to be giving us a lesson about the Appalachian Mountains. All right. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Hannah. I work at the Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy. I know it's a heck of a name. Um, our organization works to protect farmland, um, habitat for unique plants and animals, recreation, and uh, the scenic view sheds that we get to see from the tops of our mountains when we're hiking. Um, so we do a lot of things and we do it uh, to protect land for the future benefit of uh, generations that are to come and also for people to uh, continue to enjoy our land right now. So um, my video is about the formation of our mountains and how they came to be and what makes them so special right now. And then at the end, there'll be a little craft for you guys to make your own mountain range. So I hope you enjoy. And I will be on after to answer questions. Hey everyone, I'm Hannah and I am the Communications and Community Engagement AmeriCorps member at the Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy. Today for Earth Day I thought it would be really fun to talk about how our little corner of the earth in the Southern Appalachian Mountains was made and why it's so special. The Southern Appalachian region is known worldwide for its scenic beauty and biological diversity. To understand how these mountains came to be home to over 10,000 different species of plants and animals, we will have to do a little time traveling to read the origin story that was written for us in the rocks. 270 million years ago, the continents that were ancestral to North America and Africa collided. Huge masses of rocks were pushed and piled up to form mountains that we now know as the Appalachians. As a result of the collision, rocks that had originally formed on different continents in diverse environments came together to set the stage for the diversity of landscape, habitat, and life forms that characterize the Southern Appalachians today. Some of the rock types formed highly specialized habitats such as balds, high elevation rocky summits, and granite domes. Other types, like metamorphosed sandstone, formed outcrops and cliffs that are habitats for scattered communities of rare plants and animals. Metal-rich rock layers produce the acidic soils that some species, such as red spruce, need to flourish, while volcanic rocks produce soils that favor oak forests. Many of the rocks that you will find in this region are metamorphic rocks formed under heat and pressure that cause the existing sedimentary and other rock types to squish and fold into each other to form our mountains. If you look closely, you can still see these folded patterns in our rocks today. You can also find igneous rock exposed in this area in places where the surrounding metamorphic rock has eroded away. A local example of this is looking glass rock. About 11,000 years ago, during the Pleistocene Epoch, great sheets of ice steadily advanced southward from their polar region. The glaciers did not reach our mountains, but the resulting change in climate did. Animals and plants were pushed, carried, or forced to migrate southward. Species that were usually found in the north, such as the sawwet owl and ancestors of our Carolina northern flying squirrel, sought refuge in the southern Appalachian mountains. This is why today, these species and their descendants can still be found in our mountains at high elevations. As we know, the different rock types that make up our mountains have created a variety of different landforms and soil characteristics, resulting in a wide range of habitat diversity. This, coupled with the migration of diverse plant and animal species that weren't common to this region before, have all set the stage for the scenic beauty and biodiversity that we now have here in the Southern Appalachian Mountains today. 
This region is now home to over 10,000 different species. There are around 70 different types of mammals, 460 different types of spider, roughly 100 native trees, and 1,400 other flowering plants. 2,300 species of fungi have been identified, with many more to be discovered. And over 30 species of salamander can be found in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, earning its name as the salamander capital of the world. And there are a few other incredibly unique creatures that can be found here. And that's you, and me, and everybody else who lives in these mountains and can call this place home. Although sometimes in pictures, it may seem like everything in this region exists in a beautiful natural harmony, the truth is this global hotspot for biodiversity has actually been impacted recently and historically by human and natural threats. Things like deforestation, chemical pollution, climate change, and invasive pests all uh, threaten the ecosystem and the health of this region. However, by doing things like increasing our knowledge and appreciation for the environment's current and historic situation, which you're doing now by watching this video, doing things like volunteering with local environmental organizations after we're all allowed to get back together and work together, um, and doing things also like making environmentally conscious decisions in your own everyday life, we can all do our part to support the health of the ecosystems and promote better quality of life for all that live in our beautifully diverse region of the southern Appalachian Mountains. Alright everyone, happy Earth Day. I hope you enjoyed that video. Stay tuned to learn how to make your very own mountain range out of recycled paper and scrap paper. Okay, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you. Were there any questions or anything like that? No, we don't have any questions right now, but if anything comes up, um, it will show up in the QA or it, uh, on that platform. Okay, sounds good. That. That's awesome. Yeah, for those of you who are interested in maybe doing that craft, uh, just a reminder that this webinar is going to be available after uh, we're completed with the lessons for today. So. You can pause the video, you can take a little more time for it, um, and you can make a really, really cool piece of art. All right, thanks again, Hannah. Um, and next, we're going to have Natalie from Conserve Carolina. She's going to give us a lesson on Leave No Trace. Thank you guys so much for having me over at Riverlink. Um, I am Natalie. I'm the Community Engagement Associate AmeriCorps member at Conserving Carolina. And uh, I put together a short little video to go over the Leave No Trace principles, which are seven principles that will help us to engage with nature and have little impact. And so I'll talk a little bit more about what those mean. Um, feel free to uh, drop questions in the Q&A box as it's going. Since I am here, I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards. Um, and as we're going along, I'll be teaching some hand tricks um, to remember the leaf and trace principles. So feel free to do those hand tricks along with the video. Um, and then there will be a craft at the end, which similar to what Hallie just mentioned with um, Hannah's video, uh, feel free to go back and do that at a later time. Um, so you can pause the video and have time to do the, the full craft. So um, Hannah is gonna play that video for me for technology purposes. So uh, thank you so much, Hannah. 
Hello, my name is Natalie and I'm the Community Engagement Associate at Conserving Carolina. Today, I want to share with you the seven Leave No Trace principles, or as they're more commonly known, LNT. LNT stands for Leave No Trace, which is a framework created by the Center of Outdoor Ethics to provide guidance on how to have little to no impact while we're exploring outdoors. While Leave No Trace is based in backcountry principles, these principles can easily be adapted to wherever you are exploring from a nearby park or trail to your own backyard. I will be going over each of the seven principles while providing a hand trick to remember each of them, and then we will do an activity to help us understand uh, one of these principles better. So let's get started. The first principle is to plan ahead and prepare. The hand symbol for each principle will correspond with the number of the principle. So for number one, we will use one finger and put it up to the side of our head. This helps us to remember to think about what we are bringing and remember to plan ahead. This principle is important to help us safely explore outdoors. Here are some questions that you can ask yourself the next time you're planning your next outing. What will the weather be like? Will I need a rain jacket or sunscreen? Do I have a map if I get lost? Do I have enough food and water? By planning ahead, we make sure that we are doing our best not to damage any natural resources. The second principle is to camp and hike on durable surfaces. For this principle, we're gonna use two fingers to make a person walking and walk along your arm. This helps us to remember that we should stay on the trail to minimize any impact to any of the important species that we find outdoors. If a lot of people walk over an area with the plants, those plants will no longer be able to grow, so it is best to stay on the trail. Principle three is to dispose of waste properly. Use three fingers to make a small scoop shape. This creates a shovel that helps us to remember that whatever we pack in, we must pack out. This principle is really important so that we can avoid pollution in any of these natural areas. Plastic can take over a thousand years to decompose. Before you leave a space you're visiting, make sure you check you aren't leaving anything behind. Check for wrappers or crumbs and put it in your bag to put it in the trash whenever you get back home. Principle four is to leave what you find. To remember this principle, we're gonna use four fingers to create the sign language letter B. This reminds us to leave things B. <laughs> when we see something outdoors, like a pretty flower or a rock or a leaf, sometimes we would like to take it home with us, but instead try taking a picture. By taking a photo, instead of taking these things, we are not damaging the natural environment. Principle five is to practice fire safety. We'll use five fingers to make a fire to remember this principle. While on a day trip or in your backyard, you may not be making a fire, but if you do find yourself in the back country overnight, this principle is very important. But only people who have trained and practiced making safe fires should practice this principle. The sixth principle is to respect wildlife. For this principle, put three fingers on each hand and make animal ears. This reminds us to respect wildlife. The easiest way to respect wildlife when exploring is to practice the rule of thumb. Extend your arm out in front of you and do a thumbs up. If you can't cover the animal with your thumb, then you are too close. This allows the animal a safe distance to feel safe and act normally. Some other things we can do to respect wildlife are not to feed wild animals with our food and make sure to pick up food scraps. We have to remember that we are just visitors in their homes. The seventh and final principle is to be considerate of others. For this principle, we'll put five fingers on one hand and two fingers on the other. We'll use this when passing others on the trail to say hello and wish them peace. We have to remember that we are sharing the outdoors with others when we want to explore. Some people come outside to listen to the quiet sounds of nature, although sometimes I want to scream how excited I am to be spending time outside, I have to remember to respect others and explore quietly. Also, do your best to stay on the side of the trail and allow others to pass. If the path is really narrow, people going downhill should step aside to allow others to pass. Phew, that was a lot. Uh, but I hope those hand tricks can help you to remember these important principles that allow us to leave no trace as we explore. Let's review those principles really quick. Principle one is to plan and think ahead. Principle two is to travel and camp on durable surfaces. Principle three is whatever you pack in, you pack out. Principle four is to leave things be. 
Principle five is to practice fire safety. Principle six is to respect wildlife by practicing the rule of thumb. And principle seven is to be kind to others on the trail. Say hello and wish them peace while they explore. Now we'll practice one of our Leave No Trace principles. The Outdoor Ethic Institute has more activities on their website to get to know these principles better, but the one that we'll be practicing today is helping us remember to leave it be. For this activity, you will need a blank piece of paper, a colored pencil or crayon, and a leaf that you found outside. Make sure to find a leaf that's already on the ground and don't pick any leaves off living plants. Now take a couple minutes to observe your leaf. Figure out why you are drawn to it. What do you notice about the leaf? Use your senses, see what you notice. Notice the color, the texture, maybe what it smells like, not what it tastes like though. What do you wonder about the leaf? What makes you curious about the leaf? How long ago did it come to the spot you found it? What makes it that color? And finally, what does it remind you of? Does the shape remind you of a character you know or an item you've seen before? Now, I don't know about you, but now that I've observed this leaf, I don't wanna let it go. But I have to remember our fourth L and T to leave it be. And I can start by taking a picture, but another way to take this leaf with me is to do this activity. Place your leaf on a hard surface and place the piece of paper on top of the leaf. Use your crayon or colored pencil at an angle and rub with pressure to color the paper over the leaf. You will begin to see your leaf appear on the paper. Now you can put your leaf back where you found it outside and take your new paper leaf wherever you want and keep it forever, still practicing leave no trace principles and leaving it be. Thank you so much for joining me to learn about the leave no trace principles. I hope you are able to use these as you explore outdoors. Show us at Conserving Carolina what you have been doing to leave no trace where you are exploring. Thanks so much. Um, hope that was helpful in teaching you guys the seven leave no trace principles. I know those hand tricks are really helpful for me to remember them as I am exploring outdoors um, and a good reminder uh, to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to have as little impact while I uh, explore this beautiful area we live in. So Hallie, did you see any questions come up? Cool. No questions so far, but if anything comes up, uh, they'll be in the Q&A. So if something Thumbs up later for any of you who are still watching. Um, you can go ahead and just post that in the Q&A and Natalie can answer. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, that was a great way to think about some of the things that are important when we're going out and exploring. So once those trails do start opening up and we can get outside, those seven principles are really good to keep in mind. So thanks again to Natalie. Um, and up next, we have Tay from EQI. He's going to be giving a lesson and craft about watersheds. So Tay, if you want to go ahead and get started. Cool. Hi, everyone. My name is Tay. I am from EQI. I am the stream monitoring coordinator. Much like a lot of the other uh, presenters today, I'm part of AmeriCorps Project Conserve. So we do a bunch of conservation work throughout Western North Carolina. Um, so today I have a little activity to do with you guys. Um, I created a little video a while back um, for us to watch. It is our watershed model video. Um, it's very simple to make, uh, really fun and easy to do. So I'll show that video with you guys now if I can figure out how to do that. So here. Hello, everyone. My name is Tay Holiday. I am the stream monitoring coordinator at EQI. I'm bringing you today a little short activity that you can do from home while in isolation right now. Um, it's really great. It's a little watershed model. 
really simple, really easy to do with kids. Um, I actually love it a lot too. I think it's great for all ages, so you can all take part. Uh, all you're going to need is a couple blank sheets of paper, so just standard printer paper works fine, uh, some washable markers, and then a little a spray bottle works really well. If you don't have the spray bottle, that's okay. You can also just use like a little bowl of water, sprinkle it with your fingertips. Uh, that always works well. Um, so yeah, I'll show you how it's done. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to have a blank piece of paper right here. And what you're going to do, really simple, you're just going to crumple up your paper into a nice big ball, just like that. Really simple. And then you will want to make sure it's nice and crumpled. You want to unfold that piece of paper. There you go. Uncrumpled piece of paper, just like that. Um, so this will act like our mountains in our watershed model. As you can see, you have lots of nice little ridges and little valleys and whatnot now. Uh, to define that, we're going to want to use a washable marker, and we're just going to trace along those ridges right there, just like that. I already did it pre before this video. Uh, so all of our ridges, we just mark it with washable marker. Uh, that way, when we add water, it will go down the, the ridges and form our little rivers and lakes and ponds and things like that, just like it would do in real life. Uh, so get to that point, and then you will spray a little bit of water on it and see where it goes. Once you've done that activity, you now understand what water does in a watershed. It acts just like a bathtub. Uh, water on top of those mountains will all flood down into those river basins, and that's where we get our rivers and lakes from. Uh, so then the next step is going to be adding pollutants into our water. So before crumpling up our piece of paper this time, take a different colored marker and draw some streets, some industry, maybe a couple cars, some farms. I like to add little symbols. It makes it a lot more fun. Uh, so I got a little cow there. He's going moo. Um, so do that first and then you're going to crumple it up just like you did that first one. Uh, except this time you're going to do a different colored marker and do the ridges as well. So that will be your tops of your mountains and you'll also have your different sources of pollution along the way. Um, once you've got this, you can do the exact same thing, spray it with water really quick, um, and you can see what happens. Uh, before you do so though, make sure you take a guess at what happens. Now that we've done our models and our simulations, it's a great time to ask some questions and for you guys to think about. Uh, the first being, what changed? Uh, did any of those colors mix while you were doing the simulation there? Um, where did the water from the factory end up? Did it enter into the same streams that the people were using, or did it stay off in its own little sector? Um, finally, uh, we drew a road on our paper as well. Um, where did that rain that landed on this road end up? Uh, is it easy to identify one spot where, on the road where the water is coming from? Um, think about these questions really quick, and you can pause the video for a second and think about it. Um, I will get back to you with what I think might be happening in just a second. So what you probably noticed is that water uh, was entering the same stream. So if it was from that factory, from the farm, from the road, it was all getting into the same water system. So those streams were probably multicolored at that point. So the factory, it's easy to identify that source of pollution. That's what we call point source pollution. It's easy, easily identifiable. We know where it's coming from. That water is entering, or that pollutant is entering the water much like water from the mountainside would be doing. Uh, the second source of pollution is non-point source. So that is a lot like roads, um, other things like that where we can't really define a point where that pollutant is coming into the water. So when it rains, all those chemicals, say like oil from cars that might be on the road, it all gets flushed down into the streams much like it would if it just rains on the mountainside. Uh, so it's really hard to kind of picture where that pollutant is coming from. We know the general area, but not the point. So yeah, it's a really great way to look at pollution in our watershed. Um, it's a great way to play around with watersheds as well. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, feel free to ask any questions and maybe I can help you guys out. Um, yeah, hope you have fun. Bye. Cool, so that was our watershed model activity. Um, when I did it here at home, I actually didn't use a washable marker, so it didn't work as well. That's why I didn't show that in the video. 
Um, it's just something that I didn't have on me. So I do recommend using washable markers. It works really well. Um, I didn't show you the results of it either because it is really something fun to do on your own. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, just leave them down in the Q&A section and I will stick around and answer as many as I can. All right, thanks, Tay. Yeah, that seems like an awesome craft that you can do um, during this time of quarantine, something that you could share with your friends, maybe try some different colors and see the differences in your maps. Um, so once we have this webinar available for you to watch later, that could be something really good to try out and share with your friends. All right, thanks again to Tay. And our next is going to be from Justin at Riverlink. He's going to be teaching us about a stormwater model. So if just, Justin, if you're ready. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm super excited to be here celebrating Earth Day with all of you. Um, there's been some fantastic videos and educational activities and lessons so far. Um, I'm going to be sharing a video with you all uh, talking about stormwater and land use. Um, so I hope you enjoy it and I hope you learn something new. On stormwater and land use. Today we'll be using our interactive stormwater model to look at various different types of land use and developments that you might find within your own community. We'll then get to see how these developments interact with stormwater and the effects that they can have on your neighborhood and your local streams and rivers. Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right in. Our stormwater model is made up of plastic and acrylic and has a beautiful little community of tiny monopoly houses dotting the landscape. The river that runs through this community fills up with water from the various types of land uses that we see at the top of the model. For each type of land use that we use, we'll be pouring the same amount of water into the simulation. The first type of land use that we're going to look at is wetlands. Wetlands can be beautiful natural features. These are distinct ecosystems that are flooded by water, either permanently or seasonally, and serve as a great habitat for many creatures. They're also highly absorbent in nature. In our model, our wetland is represented by six sponges. These sponges are also quite absorbent in nature and act as a good replication of our natural wetlands. As you can see, the rain is falling pretty heavily on them, and we still have none flowing out of the front into our river. Eventually, however, the water does begin to flow as the wetland, or the sponges, reaches its maximum capacity for carrying water. As the water flows downstream, it starts to reach our first little community on the left. These houses are built pretty close to the river, and they're lucky that the wetland has held back so much of the rainwater. It looks like our homes are going to be safe this time from any sort of flooding. However, our upland wetland is now saturated with water and will not be able to hold back nearly as much rainwater during the next storm. If we look at the scale on the side of the model, we see that the water reaches a level of about 5.06. We'll need to keep this number in mind for reference with our later trials using different landforms. As we squeeze out our sponges, we see just how much water our wetland was able to absorb. Next, let's take a look at a much more urban type of land use, parking lots. Parking lots have become essential for our day-to-day -day lives. However, these spaces are often made using what we call impervious surfaces. These are surfaces such as asphalt or concrete that don't allow water to filter down through them into the soil. Our parking lot here has some hot wheels and a lovely shopping mall. And as the rain begins to fall, we see that it goes directly off the parking lot and into our river. There's nothing to absorb it and nothing to hold that water back. As the water flows downstream, we see it comes on much quicker than it did in our test with the wetland. And it very quickly begins to overtake our homes in our low-lying communities. Unfortunately for these homes, they're pretty light and they get washed right downstream. Our downstream communities are no exception to this flooding. Without anything to hold these rainwaters back, many communities see themselves underwater and facing some pretty big challenges in the near future.
If we look at our scale, we see that the water rises much higher than on our trial with the wetlands. We end up at a level of about 5.16. For our final land use, we'll be looking at retention ponds, also known as stormwater control measures. These features are a wonderful compromise between the urban and environmental needs of a community. Their main function is to serve as a holding cell for the excess stormwater before it enters a local waterway. These features can be installed in many locations, including alongside roads and parking lots, beside greenways, and in residential areas. As water enters the retention pond, it pools up behind the embankment. The water level must then rise high enough to exit the pond through the discharge pipe. On our model, our retention pond is found underneath our parking lot, and you can even see a small discharge pipe facing the river. As we begin to make it rain, we can see that the water flows directly off the parking lot, just like before. But this time, there is a retention pond to capture all of the excess. We can see that it takes quite a while for any water to start flowing out of our discharge pipe. That means our retention pond is doing its job quite well. As we move downstream, we see a river flow that is much more similar to our wetland flow than the one we saw with our parking lot. Seem to be safe from flooding, thanks to the extra stormwater capacity provided to us by our retention pond. Installing retention ponds and stormwater control measures is one of the main ways that Riverlink works to address stream health within Western North Carolina. If we look at our scale one last time, we see that the water rises to only 5.04, even lower than our first trial with the wetlands. All right, so today we learned about three distinct land uses or developments that you might find along a stream or river. Wetlands, parking lots, and retention ponds. We learned that wetlands are not only great at providing habitat for animals, they also soak up a ton of rainwater and prevent damage to our downstream human communities. We learned that the impervious surfaces of our parking lots can lead to an excess of runoff, which can promote downstream flooding in our neighborhoods. And we learned that retention ponds are a great way of controlling our stormwater while still allowing for the existence of our essential functions in an urban environment. We here at Riverlink believe that a healthy stream or river can lead to a thriving community. We hope that through this video today, you learned something new and will now go forth and help promote healthy stream ecosystems within your own neighborhood. Thank you. I don't see any questions, so I think we can go ahead and move on. Yeah, no questions right now, but if anything comes up, um, go ahead and just post it in the Q&A. Uh, that was an awesome presentation about our stormwater model. Um, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to show you it in person. It's really fun to watch but that was a great way to be able to see it um, virtually today. So thank you, Justin, that was great. All right, and now we're gonna have our last art and poetry contest announcement from Anna. Um, and whenever you're ready, we can start that. All right, I'm going to share the last slides so you'll be able to see all of the winners and their pieces. So hopefully you guys can see that now. So we're doing the sixth through eighth grade and then we have the ninth through 12th grade at the end. We only had one submission for that, um, but you'll see that towards the end. So sixth through eighth grade winners, starting with third place for the 2D and 3D art category is Dawson Webb with their piece, Eagle by the River. And it's really, it's kind of hard to tell in the picture, but it's kind of textured. They put kind of paper mache pieces on top of it. So it's a really cool piece to see in person. Now for the second place for 2D and 3D art category in the sixth or eighth grade grade range is B Bowers with their piece, A Glimpse of Reflection. And they added in a why they made their Glimpse of Reflection. They made this piece because originally, as originally for a river guide project for their school, but they come to realize that this piece is much more than a river at sunset. It represents how water holds memory and that beauty is found if you dig deeper. So really great reasoning behind their art piece. And then we had first place for the 2D and 3D art category in the sixth or eighth grade range is Austin Vets with their piece, Peaceful River, which is great. I really love 
the branches on the trees that looked like the antlers on the deer. I think it's really awesome. Okay, now getting into our poetry and writing category for sixth or eighth grade. The third place winner was Jason Sobermonti. And again, sorry if I say any of your names wrong, uh, but Jason wrote a poem called When I See the River. So that was third place for poetry and writing. Second place for poetry and writing category for sixth or eighth grade was Kate Lehman with her piece, The Nanahala River. And we actually have a video of Kate reading her piece, so I'll show that to you next. Hi, I am Kate Lehman, and my poem is titled The Nanahala River. As I canoe down the gloomy Nanahala on the lookout for rocks, I hear the swish of the near tree, bending over the side of the river, river whispering something in my ear. I inhale the aroma surrounding me, its feel musty of the dew from the morning. I hear the sound of rushing water, the river starts to dip, then curve, up and down. It's like a roller coaster. Not giving up yet, I paddle, paddle, and paddle. But the river is too strong. This living creature carries me. As it carried me, the rapids started to diminish, but the river still took me. I needed to escape from the forceful current. A, sh a section of peaceful water caught my eye behind a massive rock. I ferried my way over to shelter. When I was satisfied with my position, I took a look at the monster of water that I just defeated and proceeded with my adventure. What inspired me is I go to French Broad River Academy and I canoe lots of rivers and I heard and felt and saw most of the things that are in this poem and I did this river guide in one of my classes and I did it about the Nanahala River. Thank you. All right, thanks so much for sending in that video, Kate. It's nice to hear from you. And then we have our first place winner for the poetry and writing category for sixth or eighth grade is Lady Beth Weymouth with her poem, Lady Green. And we have Lady Beth, hopefully I'm saying your, great, your name right, uh, with us. And so Hallie is going to unmute her and she's going to be able to read her poem for us. Hey, so I am also a student of the French Broad River Academy. Um, I did this as our uh, project for our river guide. And so here I go. Um, this is called Lady Green. She has a mouth but never speaks. She always runs but never walks. She is always on the go, never stopping. Her style leaves the morals of this world. Oh, wait, I can't see. Around her mesmerized. The disappearance of her movement so effortlessly does it. The rocks are her stars, bandages can't fix her. Her fists, fists pound water, waves crest. When she's upset, she rages. She cleanses us to meeting the world around her. Lady Green, the darkness are jewels of her crown. The mist of her breath as a fairy as a ghost. Her loving hand, a kind ecosystem. The flow of her movement calms me like a lullaby. When she leaves you, she never returns. Awesome. Thanks so much for reading that. Uh, do you have anything to say about your inspiration behind the piece? Uh, so, my inspiration was. The river guide. Um, we paddled the Green River um, one week starting school, and it was just very amazing. And it was um, awesome. So that was my inspiration for that. Great. Thank you for sharing. Thanks for getting on here and reading with us. I'm glad all of you are getting a lot of experience on these different rivers, like the Green River and the Nanahala. It's awesome to see that. All right. So that was first place winner for poetry and writing in sixth or eighth grade with Lady Beth and her poem, Lady Green. And now we're going to announce the winner for our ninth through twelfth grade. And we just had one. And so that is Celia Gibbs with her poem, Moondrop Tears. She got first place in poetry and writing for ninth through twelfth grade. And I'll read her poem again called Moondrop Tears. Weeping with a silent smile, the moon's tears slide down her pitted face. 
falling swiftly to the earth as raindrops to pool together as life gives waters. Rivers of glittering sorrow giving birth to Eden, to the Earth Mother. And that's awesome. It's really nice to see all of these poems for you guys. I'm going to stop sharing now. I'm really appreciative of all of the submissions that we had, some awesome uh, artwork and some really beautiful poems. I really enjoyed seeing all of the pieces from our students this year, um, and I look forward to seeing any pieces in the future too. All right, thanks, Anna, and thanks to Kate and Laylee for reading off your pieces. Those were really awesome and super inspiring. Um, that's it for our lessons in our art and poetry. I'm just gonna say a couple thanks to everyone, um, and then you're all free to go. So um, thank you all so much for being here to celebrate Earth Day with us. Um, we hope you enjoyed the lessons and have learned a ton. Um, and we hope you're feeling inspired to be environmental stewards in the future. Um, one last shout out to our sponsor, Budget Dumpster. Each year they support conservation organizations across the country by donating dumpsters for cleanup events. And that's a really important service that we're super, th we're super thankful for their support. Um, a big thanks to everyone who submitted to the art and poetry contest and congrats to the winners. Um, and then a big thanks to our presenters and all of the hard work and time they put in to make the presentations. You guys are awesome. We appreciate you so much. Um, and then we, we hope you are all staying safe and continue to celebrate Earth Day, not just today, but into the future, um, and enjoy our beautiful environment. Um, we miss seeing you in person, and we're so excited to be able to do lessons um, with you all again, hopefully as soon as possible. Um, like I said before, the recording is going to be available, um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and just one more reminder to be responsible when going outside, follow those rules of social distancing and be safe. Feel free to follow us at river.link on Instagram and definitely check out some of our other presenters and the other organizations as well. They have some really awesome online resources for days you're feeling a little bit bored and need some inspiration. So uh, lots of cool crafts and all sorts of stuff. Um, and that's basically it. So that's all I have for today. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, happy Earth Day and hope you have a great rest of your day. Can I make a last announcement, Hallie? Yeah. Okay, so I've had this question a couple of times and I've answered it individually in the Q&A, but I wanted to address it here. For our contest winners, you did receive prizes from lots of great um, local businesses and organizations like the Asheville Pinball Museum and No Taste Like Home and The Hop. Lots of great places donated prizes for you. We are still trying to figure out the best way to get those to you and for those of you who donated physical pieces of art to get or submitted physical pieces of art to get those back to you. So we will be in touch with our contest winners um, about that as we have more updates. So you will get those prizes and your artwork back but it might be a minute before that happens. Awesome, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Thanks everyone, happy Earth Day. Thanks, everybody. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. <laughs> Happy Earth Day.